S. Professor Cook here. I am back with part two of heteronormativity, gender, and masculinity. Uh, last time we left off looking at um, the question of what is masculinity, and I left off on this slide with the lovely uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, still from an old movie in the late 80s, I believe, early 90s. Um, we didn't actually look at this sheet that I am referencing in the slides here. Um, but what, what it is is a bunch of definitions that essentially have the associations of strength with masculine and um, with weakness as feminine. Uh, and then if you're interested, you can click this link and there's a little clip of the film uh, Back to the Future, a little, a little excerpt from that. And what this is trying to show you, or the argument I'm trying to set up here, is the association implicit in our culture between masculinity uh, and violence um, and how if you are a real man you have to so, sort of prove that and show that through violent expressions um, and that's sort of an implicit assumption in our gender roles in our culture. Um, if you remember back in Social 101 if we had that class together we actually looked at mass shootings in the United States over the last uh, seven to eight years and talked about how most of the time, something like 95% of the time, those shootings are done by uh, men. There's only, there have only been maybe um, four or five out of over 200, close to 300, that were committed by women. Uh, and so we could ask the question, why? Why is it that it's mostly men doing those shootings? Um, and the part of the answer um, looks at the relationship and trying to show it between um, threats to someone's masculinity and maybe what we might call overdoing gender or the tendency for people to to overreact um, to a threat to their masculinity. Okay, so I want to kind of talk through some of these research studies with you. Before I do that, I want to say again, I'm not assuming this is true of all men or all women. Okay, this is just explaining how our social construction of expectations is different based on gender and that leads to consequences. Um, essentially when, if someone questions my uh, femininity as a woman, my tendency is not to react with violence. Um, but what we see is if someone threatens another person's masculinity, the tendency is, is to react to some extent with violence. And here's how we try to test that. Um, when they took men and women and put them in a, this study took, excuse me, let me back up. This study took men and women and put them in a simulation. And they were roughly college aged. So, um, you know, between 18 and 25. This was done a few years ago. But this has been demonstrated more than once in a laboratory setting. Throughout this condition, men were somehow told they were feminine or their masculinity was questioned through this um, performance test that they were given. Um, and when they did that, then they measured attitudinal support for things after that. And what they found was men who had their masculinity, quote unquote, threatened in this way when they were told they were feminine in, in their responses online. And then they were measured and their attitudes were asked about sexual assault and homophobic attitudes and support for war, they showed more support for war, purchasing an SUV. I'm not really sure why that was one of the questions as an outcome, but they also demonstrated more homophobic attitudes and more problematic attitudes about sexual assault and rape. Okay, um, And then in small groups, in a different study, men were more likely to show anxiety if they didn't achieve some sort of higher status outcome in that group. And if they were in a group with women, um, this did not happen. So it was mostly men in groups of men feeling like they had to sort of prove their masculinity to one another. That's kind of an important consideration. Um, I also want to talk about this article that I did not assign, but it's important to understand why so much um, sexual violence goes unnoticed. And I want to draw the connection here between just talking about masculinity and violence and the idea of sexual violence. 
um, which I will do in a minute. But first, let me back up and kind of explain this study a little bit. So this study uh, was done by a researcher called named Heather Flavka, I believe that's how you say it, in Milwaukee. And it came out mm, five or six years ago. And she, what she did was she interviewed um, young women, mostly teen girls and preteen girls, and wanted to understand the rates of both the rate, overall rate of sexual violence and assault that they experienced during in dating relationships. So this would be from a boyfriend or someone they were dating. And also why so many women and young girls did not report this. Okay. So the rate of sexual assault was something like up to 40% reported some kind of violence or assault in a dating relationship, um, which led to like this conclusion that 20% of girls experience dating violence. And a third of that, a third of that was sexual assault. Okay. So those are like the general numbers on sexual assault. And in this context, Lavka, the researcher, interviewed 100 youth at this group called the Child Advocacy Center. The ages were 3 to 17, and there were different, there was some uh, diversity in terms of racial and age representation. So out of this subsample now, out of these 100 girls, 32% or 23 girls did not identify what was done to them as violent. They understood it as normal. Okay, I'm going to say that again. Out of this sample of 100 interviews, only about 68% okay, identified assaults that had happened to them as an assault. The remaining third, or 23 girls, saw the violence as normal, so they did not consider what happened to them as an assault. And if you read the article, there are clear descriptions of this, and it, it clearly, we would all agree it was assault. It would be legally defined that way, but the girls did not understand it that way. Why? Okay, so that was the follow up question for Halavka is why do so few young women uh, formally report their victimization experience, and why do they not see it as, a, as assault? The results um, said this, quote, unique characteristics emerge through inductive analysis and reveal patterned heterogendered scripts appropriated to account for violence experienced. Young women often held themselves and their peers responsible for acting as gatekeepers of men's behaviors. That is a very um, academic way of saying basically girls felt that they did something to provoke their boyfriends or men that they had relationships with into the assault. So they were blaming themselves, the victims, right, for the assault, and therefore they didn't understand it as assault, okay? What they mean here through patterned heterogendered scripts, these, this gets at those assumptions we have implicit in our gender roles and our sexuality that we associate with those gender roles as um, being either active or passive, kind of violent or submissive, right? So this is how it connects back. Um, I mean, one second. This is how it connects back to that correlation that, that is established through everything we see in the media and social construction between masculinity and violence. Okay. I'm not, again, I'm not saying this is everybody. This is just messages that we get. We expect um, men to be aggressive in their sexuality. We expect women to have to be protective and defensive. And that's a problem, Halavka is saying here, because what that results in is girls not understanding what is happening to them in the context that they should and not identifying that they are victims of assault, thinking that that's normal. That's why the, t the article is called Normalizing Sexual Violence. Okay, moving on, I want to explain a couple of definitions to you that come out of gender and um, sexual orientation studies of, of uh, gender and sexual identities and diversity. These sound very similar, but they're slightly different. 
So I will try to be very clear when I explain these. Okay. Compulsory heterosexuality, okay? Compulsory heterosexuality is our assumption that people are one heterosexual and that they want to be in a relationship, okay? So this is um, the idea that if I don't know otherwise, I might assume, one, you are straight, and two, you are either in a relationship or you want to be in a relationship with an opposite sex partner, okay? So I think examples of this would be if you are a woman of a certain age and you are not married, and, and this is true for men as well, but if you are a person of a certain age and you're not married, you uh, may f get pressure, right? You may uh, experience some pressure from people um, around you and family members and people trying to set you up with their cousins, etc. Things like that. And that is revealing this, this idea here that you either need to be in a relationship or you need to be looking for one, right? So that's, that's that assumption that being single is somehow, you know, a less desirable trait and that, of course, you're looking for an opposite sex relationship. So Adrian Rich, who came up with this con conceptualization, said that um, this is a problem because we uh, sort of socially construct heterosexual relationships as an ideal and as a normative standard, and it also leads to male dominance over women, right? So that was the assumption, um, or not assumption, excuse me, that was the critique of this concept from Adrian Rich. All right, moving on a little bit, this concept of heteronormativity is slightly different, okay? So compulsory, meaning mandatory heterosexuality is gotta be in a relationship, I gotta be looking for one. You know, I always think of that show, The Bachelor, The Bachelorette, which I don't watch um, and have maybe watched a little bit of, but the fact that shows like that exist kind of uh, exemplifies that concept, um, I think. So, okay, moving on. Heteronormativity is slightly different as a concept. This is more about the assumption that someone is straight uh, or that it is normative and normal to be straight, and that people fall uh, neatly into binary gender categories. So if, for example, you meet someone and they're wearing a wedding ring and that person um, is a man, and you want to invite that person over and their, and their partner for dinner, and you say, hey, Bill, why don't you bring your wife um, you are sort of assuming that that Bill is straight and that the wedding ring indicates he's married to a woman, when that may or may not be the case, right? So that's not necessarily your fault. It's a part of growing up um, in America that we are a heteronormative culture. And it's it's interesting to think about this. I'm, tr I'm trying to um, remember, but I, I can tell you that, like, until the last five or six years, you it was really difficult to purchase same-sex uh, Valentine's Day or uh, wedding cards, like greeting cards. So if this were Valentine's Day, I would I would challenge you to go find some, and I think you can you can definitely find some now. But it's it's actually kind of difficult um, not to find uh, straight assuming or heteronormative cards. And you can also think about this that's that's changed, I think, since the legalization of same-sex marriage. Now you can find some of that, but the assumptions are still sort of embedded uh, in our minds at a cultural level. And you can really also see this in terms of the gender binary. If you look at um, baby cards, like to congratulate a couple on or a family on, on having a baby or welcoming a baby, it is extremely challenging not to find stereotypically boy or girl um, congrats on the baby cards. And I know this because I end up buying ridiculous cards and just writing my own um, because I get really frustrated at the pink for girls and blue for boys stuff in the even in the baby cards. And that could, uh, that's also often before we even know um, the sex of the baby, right? Okay, so these two concepts, compulsory heterosexuality and heteronormativity, are important for understanding 
uh, the expectations that we put on men and women in both the expression of their masculinity and femininity in our society and also how that leads into assumptions around sexuality. Okay, so if we were in class, I would have us discuss um, how this leads to the assumption that men are sort of predatory and aggressive sexually and women are passive and defensive. And then I would have you go back and look at this clip from Back to the Future to, to illustrate that. So this, if you're interested, you can look at this. It's essentially a, a scene that has sexual assault, so I'll give you that content warning. Um, but it's pretty interesting that one character has to assert his masculinity through an act of violence. Okay, so make sure you understand Halavka's study and the normalizing sexual violence issue and how that relates to uh, these assumptions about uh, masculinity and violence. All right, so I want to wrap up these slides by talking about a concept called doing gender. Doing gender is a theory of gender as not a trait or an identity, but an interaction. Okay, doing gender was a theory of gender as an interaction uh, written by uh, West and Zimmerman in 1987. And the idea here is gender is not just something that I have or something that I think with respect to myself. It is also something that I do or perform. Um, gender as a performance is also a concept written about by uh, Judith Butler, and there are some links to Judith Butler's explanation of that in the next slides. But before I get there, let's look at these two images, okay? So if you look at those, these um, models, person one and person two, you are probably reading the person on the left with the longer hair in the black and white photo as a woman, and you are probably reading the person on the right as possibly non-binary or male. Um, and I will tell you that the person, uh, person one is a man, identifies as a man, but models women's clothing. And person two identifies as a woman, but models men's clothing. Okay. So what I would want us to think about is not necessarily trying to guess their quote unquote real gender identity. It's not that. It's more to think about if we read them as male or female, what is it about how they are posed, their makeup, their hair, their clothing? What is it about the way they are presenting themselves here that says gender or assumptions about their gender to us, right? So I would argue that they're both posing in ways that are quite um, gendered, right, are, are constructed to indicate more masculine or more feminine uh, performances, okay? So the idea of gender as an activity, it means that we're always doing it, uh, and it makes gender seem real and quote-unquote natural and linked to our sex um, that we were assigned at, at birth, but it's actually performative. It's, it's interesting to think about that. Um, what do we do that we're always doing gender? Well, you can think about if you are a male or if you are, or if you are a man or if you are a woman, everything that you do is seen through that lens. So it's, it's, you're always kind of constantly doing it, but it's really in interactions with others that it becomes sort of reified or codified into what we would consider to be gender roles. Um, so I'll give you an example. If I get emotional and cry um, in a meeting or in, in a lecture even, which I've, which I've done, um, that is seen as perhaps not super professional, but it is seen as part of my gender identity possibly or acceptable as an expression of emotion um, based on my identity as a woman. If I were a man, however, and I cried in public about something, that would be seen as not, um, not appropriate for my gendered performance, right? So nothing I do is ever entirely divorced from uh, my identity as a woman, 
as a man and as we have learned uh, from our racialized and aged identities and all those other intersections. So if you're interested, you can click on this link and this will take you to um, a link that looks at gender as um, how do we, we position ourselves, like how do we learn to do this? And then this is the one that I believe links to uh, Judith Butler and the idea of gender as, as perform performative, excuse me. These are just for fun. Um, so don't worry too much about these, but they're just kind of going through what, what is it that we put on women? What, what do we, um, how do we gender all of these, these things and how is beauty performance also a gendered performance? Okay, so I will stop there for today. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks.